Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for staying with us. I know it was quite a long mid-morning session, but uh, I'm pretty confident that we've saved the best to last, with all due respect to everyone that's went before us. When every new generation comes through and comes of age, there are questions around how they're different to older generations and how business and the world is going to be different as a result. Marketers and brands in particular think about how to engage and sell to new generations and how they're different to the generations before. Sport faces this challenge too, and possibly even more acutely than some other sectors in culture and entertainment. To take the most obvious example, gaming is clearly taking a larger share of attention time and perhaps spending among younger generations and likely taking chunks of market share away from sport. In this panel, we're going to ask, how is the relationships between younger generations and sport today different from that of older, relationship, uh, older generations? How is it similar? And where there are differences, what does this mean for our business? And we've got three excellent guests to discuss the topic. First, we have Acacia Leroy, head of trends at marketing agency Culture Group, which specializes in bridging the gap between brands and culture. Acacia has nearly a decade of experience tracking consumer trends in Asia and delivering insights to brands and industry. Acacia, thank you for joining us. Secondly, we've got Ravi Mann, head of marketing at Singapore football club Lion City Sailors, which has shaken up the Singapore Premier League after being acquired by local tech unicorn C in 2020. The Sailors have made ambitious investments in playing and coaching talent and club infrastructure as they seek to become Singapore's leading club and a regional power. Ravi, thank you for joining us. And finally, we've got Phoenix Hu. BD Director of Sports in Southeast Asia, Nielsen, the global audience insights data and analytics firm. Phoenix started her career in sport working on the FIFA Women's World Cup in China in 2007 and has also previously worked in Asia with City Football Group and the Asian Football Confederation. Phoenix, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Acacia, I'd like to start with you. You and Culture Group have done quite a bit of thinking about younger generations and their attributes, tastes, and habits. Could you tell us, uh, be quickly, a little bit more about what you and Culture Group do, and then about some of the important char characteristics and attitudes that you've observed in younger generations? So at Culture Group, our work is really in connecting the world of culture, brands, and business. And that's important because very few people in the world wake up in the morning thinking, oh my god, I really love insert telco brand. But a lot of people in the world wake up in the morning thinking, oh my god, I love K-pop, I love Dota, I love collecting sneakers. And so how can brands find relevance within these passion points that people have in order to be able to build brand relationship and brand equity with them? So speaking about culture, obviously the younger generation is really at the forefront of culture. Um, the Gen Z audience has colonized Be Real before any of us older people in the room um, even knew that that platform existed. But that's already their platform of choice. So in our work with the younger audiences, we found that there are three characteristics that really define them and set them apart from older generations. So I would say the first one is really authenticity. There's been a lot that's been said around this point of authenticity, but really there's been numerous studies that, that have found that um, the younger generations, they're more likely than older generations to say that, number one, there's too much pressure to be perfect on social media, but, and they are um, less concerned about impressing others, and they are more likely to trust other people if they know about their struggles. So it's really about portraying your authentic self. Think about it this way. Um, the millennial generation, grew up and came to digital maturity with platforms like Instagram. And platforms like Instagram promote this curated, filtered aesthetic. So a whole generation really built their lives around achieving this Instagram aesthetic, and a whole host of businesses started catering to that. But younger generations, they grew up with video in the form of short form video in live video. So think platforms like TikTok, like Twitch. And with video, things are more um, spontaneous. It's less filtered. So it's really about being real and being relatable. And I'm going to breeze through the next two really quickly. So the second one is really around connectedness and around community. Um, so much also has been said about how Gen Zs are digital natives. And to them, being all 
Oh, I was there on Fortnite when Marshmello did his first concert, first ever virtual concert. It's the Gen Z equivalent to the older generations going, I was there at Glastonbury when Jay-Z performed for the first time in 2008. So to them, virtual activations are really normal, whereas for the older, older generations, maybe virtual activations are like either, oh, it's a fascinating innovation, or it's, oh my god, I do not understand anything, anything about this. But to them, it's really normal. And, and the consequence of them being constantly online is that no matter what you like or what your passion point is, nothing is really niche anymore. Because in some corner of the internet, you can find people and you can find community who share your brand of weird. And the third one really is participation. And this is really connected to the second point. Um, because people are, uh, the younger generations are constantly online and they can find their communities and tribes, they really have new expectations around being able to participate in culture, in conversation. If you think about it, older generations look up to celebrities, public figures, athletes. Millennials follow influencers. Gen Zs, they just want to be a part of communities. So the people they support are creators that facilitate conversation, invite participation and really build communities around them. So three characteristics, authenticity, connectedness, and participation. Amazing. Thank you, Acacia. Um, Phoenix, if I could come on to you. Some intriguing big concepts and ideas from Acacia there about younger generations, but let's get some hard numbers on it. What does Nielsen's data tell us about younger generations' relationship with sport and how it compares to that of older generations? Um, uh, I would like to share three key observations from Nielsen's research and data. Um, first of all, um, the young generations they are not less engaged in sports. Um, Nielsen talks to millions of sports fans across the globe uh, every year, and there's no data shows that the Gen Z actually are less engaged in sports. On the contrary, um, we we find some interesting growth for some of the sports. Uh, um, um, for example, basketball and volleyball, they see a increased popularity across the globe in both East and the West. And badminton, which is not traditionally strong in the Philippines, actually have a 60% of young generation um, interested in that sport. And the that is 18% more than the other age group in the country. And the driving force behind this number is actually the young female fans in the country, so which is very interesting and positive numbers for our badminton fans and friends. Um, and the second uh, observation is the, um, we call it festivalization. It's quite similar to what um, Akasa just mentioned, that the young generation, they are that they're not less engaged in sports, but they they just engage in more things. So the technology enables them to to consume and engage a lot of things at the same time. So they prefer a more curated experience around sports. So uh, a combination of sports, fashion, music, um, probably shopping, all together maybe sp speak a louder voice to the young generation. Um, the third observation is that the Gen Zs, they're more tuned in, into the sustainability and social responsibility causes. So they're more um, sensitive to the social stance any sports organizations taking. They care more about the uh, economy. Uh, they care more about the um, environment. They are more likely to use renewable energies and they they're just more tuned into ESG and IDE um, topics. So um, that's the three key observations from our recent research and data. Thank you, Phoenix. Certainly heartening to know that you know, the fundamental thing, um, young you know, the, the strength of interest in sport among young generations remains strong. Um, Ravi, coming on to you, can you tell us a bit about what your challenge has been in terms of engaging younger fans at Lion City Sailors? When we spoke in advance, you described to me part of your job as making Singaporean football cool again. Uh, yeah, so I think first, you know, we're in a very unique space, um, both locally and, and just in terms of the position of where we are. A, because we're a very new club. You know, we were formed in 2020, but we've also... 
there was a lot of noise about us sort of coming to be, you know, um, C, who are a huge company. You know, obviously they do Shopee and Garena, which is gaming as well, um, is already very established. Um, and they took over and they've got these massive ambitions for us. Um, but Singapore football uh, is, a, is a unique space in its own. Um, I've been there for the last 10 years. I've seen it try to grow. I mean, they're very passionate fans there. They're very passionate people involved in it. But ultimately, it kind of does have a bit of an image problem. Like, I can't imagine a lot of us here have actually been to Singapore Premier League or an S League game. Um, again, uh, I ask myself that question every day. Why, why, why? Um, and a big part of it, we've come to realize, is, is the image problem. Is that people just don't think Singapore football is cool. Um, so a lot of things that drive us is... I mean, it sounds really like like it's fluff, but you know, I think it's rooted in in a good spirit um, to say that let's try to make it cool so that we can connect with a younger audience because we're a new club as well. We got an opportunity to sort of start from scratch. So how we want to position ourselves, how we're trying to reach these audiences, and being a football club, you know, we believe very strongly that the younger audience are the ones that are ultimately going to make the football club sustainable as well. And this is something that spans across generations. It's not unique to this generation and Gen Z. Um, how we tailor that messaging, obviously, is, is unique to this um, generation. But, you know, at the core of it, a six-year-old kid, I think I mentioned this to you, right? A six-year-old kid who walks into a football stadium, you know, every, you can put all the noise around it, but ultimately that six-year-old, seven-year-old kid, or even 12-year-old kid who walks into a football stadium there's going to be some magic there, and he's going to fall in love with that football club. Um, sure, yes, he might be super connected now, and we need to engage him on different platforms, in different ways, and speak to them constantly. And I think those three points that Gacy brought up are fantastic points, right? Those three points succinctly, I think, kind of describe how we are trying to reach our audiences as well. But ultimately, it all boils down to us as well. A bit is too pronged for us, right? Because I guess Singapore football is not as far advanced uh, as far forward as, as a lot of other sports properties. Um, so we've got the opportunity to look at it and say, okay, these are the three things that we want to do. But there's also some, it's still rooted in the sort of the traditional ideas of a kid just falling in love with football. Yeah, it's that uh, the, the unique selling point of sport, that uh, the, the visceral live experience. Um, okay, so coming back to you. Culture Group has been involved in marketing projects inside and outside of sport that uh, you think hit the right notes in terms of engaging the next generations. Um, I know you've got at least one good example of such a project in sport. Can you tell us about that and, and any other examples you think are illustrative? So I think obviously, well, Culture Group is not involved with this one, but obviously the biggest example of um, a successful marketing initiative in sports is Drive to Survive, which has been mentioned a few times this morning here as well. And there are amazing statistics around it. I think just between 2020 to 2021, it managed to gain F1 around 70 million new fans, over a quarter of that between 16 to 35, so really skewing young, and half of it is actually female audiences. Um, and just bringing back the success of Drive to Survive into the three points that we discussed earlier, um, really one thing that it really hits is the point around authenticity. Um, obviously, it is dramatized, so accurate or not accurate, we can't really say about it about that. But what Drive to Survive has done really is humanizes the key drivers and players within the sport, um, giving these people personality. So they are not just faces behind a helmet or faces behind a monitor, but they are real people. So now everybody who watches that documentary knows who is Pierre Gasly. You know who know, knows his story, and like at some level. All of us can relate to some of their stories at some level, and I think that's been really successful in getting people into the sport. And the second one is around participation. And with participation, we don't necessarily mean people get to participate in F1 to like drive F1 cars, but it's really about educating people what the sport really is about. Because before that, younger people watching the sport for the first time would see random cars going around a circuit, and nothing, there's nothing particularly exciting about that. But because of the documentary, now everybody knows what an apex is, you know? So you feel like when you watch the sport, you're a part of it, you can participate because you understand a bit better. There's a sense of conversations, a sense of community. 
And then taking this point around participation one step further, um, obviously there is SailGP, um, who's actually our client at Culture Group, and there have been two speakers from SailGP on the stage earlier this morning as well. Um, and they are doing this amazing activation around launching a DAO-owned team starting from next year. And that really speaks to the point, again, around participation that people um, expect to be able to participate at the next level within their passion points um, to have that ownership um, into whatever it is that they're passionate about. And ultimately, that's, that's really the key opportunity around Web3 because that is such a big topic at the moment, but marketers, business people need to understand that the biggest opportunity around Web3 is not really just about creating virtual worlds or minting NFTs for the sake of it, but the biggest opportunities around Web3 really is in empowering individuals, unlocking the next level of participation, like individual participation and ownership in whatever passion point that people are passionate about. And in our case, it would be sports. Thank you, Akiasia. Okay, Phoenix, can I come back to you? Web3 clearly been a huge topic at this conference, clearly holds potential and promise for interesting uses in sports marketing, even if we are still figuring it out. How significant do you expect Web3 concepts and technology to be in terms of getting younger generations engaged with sport? Um, I think Web3 um, is definitely not a topic just for the young generation. It's very important for all of us, given what's happening in that space. And um, I'm very grateful that I've learned something about Web3 uh, in these past two days from some of the industry experts. And that, as um, Agassiz just said, um, Web3 is now about the virtual experiences. So um, it's actually a new whole, whole new set of technology that in, enables a lot of new things to happen. Even though that's very a uncharted space for all of us. and um, but. The young generations the, um, are more adapted to that to that space and to that technology. And um, sports brands, sports organizations to have a presence in that space means they will have more opportunities to be discovered by the new audiences, the the, uh, the younger generations. And um, also from from these past few days, and, and I can see that. Um, Technologies and business around Web3 actually they they could also use sports as a as a vehicle to reach to the audiences that they need. So I think it's a two way round and um, yeah, but it's absolutely important for for all of us. Ravi, uh, Lion City Sailors haven't taken the plunge quite yet into Web3 cryptos and NFT. Um, why not? What what are your thoughts around the opportunity? I mean, I think first is. Back to that authenticity point, if you're going to do something, we want to do it right. Um, so we kind of have waited, we're a bit cautious in this, um, to see how the chips fall, and first to understand it as well. You know, I, honestly, some of the times like, I go into all these presentations by these people and they tell me Web3 and the NFTs and do this and do that, and I was like, man, I just feel really old right now because I have no idea what they're saying. Um, but hopefully, Phoenix, I need to attend a few more things here to learn about it, but I think it boils down to authenticity. You know. We, as a club, and me as a guy, I guess, um, a bit rebellious. Uh, I know this is going to sound weird, but we're a bit rebellious in that every time someone comes to me and says, hey, we should do this, and I'll be like, why? And they'll be like, because everyone's doing it. I say, that's terrible. Right? <laughs> so if we're going to go into it, and when we go into it, we need to understand why and how, and then when we do launch it or do sort of dip our toes into that universe, we're ready and we're doing it for the right reasons. I think, you know, for us, Fans are at the forefront of everything we do. And I think the idea of community, see, that's what we really, really want to go into and how we want to go into sort of the Web3 universe. I don't want to just make an NFT of my player and sell it for, for someone, right? Because um, that could go super wrong. And it has gone super wrong for some guys, I think, the, the, those fan token things. Um, but it was interesting. Yesterday, I just had uh, the conversation with this one guy about the fan tokens, and he was trying to take me through it. And he said, you know what? It's about community. It's about building... Um, a community with your fans, giving them a voice, giving them more power, for them, for them to feel more connected so they can participate in being part of the club. And I was like, ah, okay, this is what I want to see and how we want to grow into it. But again, we, when we do it, we want to do it properly. I think that's the thing. It's a key part of what, everything we do. Very good. And uh, I'd like to hear about that contrarian, rebellious attitude at uh, Lion City Sailors. Uh, Akesia, 
coming back to you and, um, and, and moving on a bit, uh, audiences for many major sports have traditionally skewed male. Um, there's certainly increasing focus in sport now in developing women's sport, but also developing women's audiences. Um, but what do you think sport can do better when it comes to attracting younger female fans and participants? So I think the most obvious answer to this really is just promoting women's sports even more because if young girls grow up with an example that they can look up to, then it, they would get more interested and more invested. But beyond that, the second thing is really to appeal to the lifestyle aspect. I think we had a quick chat about this um, a few weeks ago. Frisbee in China has really blown up and it's really because it's become a lifestyle of its own. So on Xiaohongshu, which is the Chinese equivalent, not Chinese equivalent, but like a platform, social media, Media platform in China, there's a bit of like a cross between Instagram, Pinterest, and an e-commerce like platform. Um, you just see all these pictures of young women um, in at leisure um, outfits, just playing frisbee, and it's just become a lifestyle thing for them. Um, We've seen this not just in sports, actually, but brands outside of sports as well, appealing to the lifestyle element to engage newer audiences. Even brands like Muji, um, which does homewares, uh, Muji opens hotels around the region because they want to let people experience the Muji lifestyle, so really appealing to the lifestyle aspect of things. And the third thing really is around the point of um, inclusivity. And by inclusivity, I don't just mean diversity and all that, but it's really about how women are represented in, in in sports, because traditionally you see um, women represented in sports in either one of two extremes. One is either you're super sexualized on the front cover of Swimsuit Illustrated, or on the other hand, you're represented as being very athletic, very fit, very muscular, and there's nothing really in between. But just having a representation, and this again speaks to the point around authenticity, because people want to be their real selves. People want to be f to to feel like they're accepted and celebrated as their real real selves as well. And so sports need to do a better job at communicating that everyone is welcome. There's a place for everybody, and come just as you are, um, in order to be able to appeal to this younger generation. Okay, very very interesting points, Akasia. Um, Ravi, I'm going to skip on to you, and I'm conscious of time. And there's a, there's another so there's another topic I'd like to tackle before we finish. Um, certain sports properties have successfully crafted quite youth-oriented brands using cultural crossovers, bringing in music, fashion, gaming, and things like this. I'm thinking about the likes of the NBA, Paris Saint-Germain, as being examples that are particularly successful at doing that. Now, Lion City Sailors have, to some extent, followed in their footsteps. Um, you've even hired a creative director to help guide you. Can you tell us about your approach? What have you done? Why have you done it? And what have the results been? So going back to that point of um, trying to make football cool, right? when, we, when I first sort of came to the sailors, I sat down and I was like, what are we doing? Let's make it cool. How do we make it cool? Uh, kids nowadays, you know, football is connected not just on the pitch, right? It's about the culture. It's about the music. Everything around that has to now grow together. We looked at PSG, actually. That was one of the bigger inspirations for us and what we were doing. And it's funny. So we have a creative director. He's a rapper, right? He's a local rapper. He's a Lion City boy. Uh, yes, we're the Lion City sailors. He's a Lion City boy. It's a bit weird. So I've known him for a long time. And I said, hey, let's go grab a coffee. I didn't even tell him why. And he was like, sure, right? Because he was like, oh, it's going to be something to do with football. And we spoke. And we both found that we were on the same page in terms of wanting to reach this audience and the newer audience and the younger audience to make them sort of fall in love with this football club and it all centered around culture fashion streetwear music and of course he is a musician right um so all connected so we the two of us then went on this journey right to create music so we have a music video kevin wrote a song and he made a music video we were running around the uh, jalambasa stadium we filmed it it turned out all right uh, people seemed to like it um, and then the streetwear as well, we collaborated with a local uh, design company, tell your children to release a little collection there. Um, we treat our home games like a, like a music festival. Like the moment you come in, you know, we've got fire going, it's a bit ridiculous, but we love it. Um, and like, you know, when a goal score, there's fire, the Kevin song gets played, there's a video going around, it's brilliant, right? And all that, because we realize the importance of it. We, we recognize that marrying all these facets of sport or culture um, is the future. And you look at it, and a lot of clubs are doing it, right? Venezia FC, I think, is an interesting one to look at as well, in that they've been maybe not so successful on the pitch. I think they got relegated from Serie A last year. But everyone wants a Venezia jersey because it's high fashion sort of thing that they're trying to put. Uh, that 
not something we would do because, again, we want success on the pitch. But there are all the examples of it. And I think if you're not embracing it, then you're going to just lose out. I think, I think that's a big thing as well now. If you're not embracing a lot of these things, you're just going to be left behind. And the audiences are not going to go along with you. Indeed, um, I th yeah, I, th I think it's a very powerful trend. Uh, Phoenix, I think you may, you touched on it earlier, and I think Nielsen has some data pointing towards the power of these uh, cultural crossovers with music, fashion, gaming, um, in creating sports brands that are attractive to younger audiences. Um, what, what are your own thoughts on how powerful and, and significant these crossovers can be? Um, I think just as uh, what Ravi and uh, Akali just mentioned, I think, um, and what I just touched upon as well, that the young generation, they, they prefer more curated uh, experience. So they, they prefer to have everything mixed together, everything be louder and more exciting. And um, even for the sports um, young talents in, in, in elite sports, um, they are um, more of a personality that has many sides rather than just sports. So if we look at Eileen Gu, um, she's, she's the, the Olympic gold, ma gold medalist, and, but she's also very active in fashion, and she's, um, she's almost a model in, 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 in that space. So, so I, think, I think those elements talk much louder to these young generations and, and um, the way the young generation enjoy and appreciate sports is not only limited to sports itself. Okay, great. Um, we do have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Ravi, um, um, I, I skipped over the, the inclusivity point with you, but I know that Lion City Sailors is doing work to develop its women's team and, and its female fan base. What, what sort of things have you guys been trying there? So I think it's very important for us to, to make sure that our women's team are at the forefront as much as our men's team. So we put as much effort into our women's team, who've just won the title as well. Well done them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and if you look at the trend in Europe, right, like women's football now is, is, is a mainstream sport, as it should be. And we are trying to recognize that quickly and bring our women's team um, to get as much coverage, to, to get or to give as much importance to them as much as we are doing to the men's team because we recognize that, you know, for too long, like, it's not been um, given the right platforms, especially locally, I think, in Singapore. And that's, I mean, I'm not saying anything bad about anyone, but it's been left behind, I think, women's football especially. You look at just the development of it, you look at the results of the national team, not just in terms of the marketing and, and how it like, sort of resonates with fans, but just in terms of the development as well that it's been given. And I think that's something that we are trying to, be at the forefront of. It's very important for us to make sure that we are very inclusive and we're really pushing our women's team just as much as we are the, the men's team. It's one brand and one family that we're moving together. Excellent. Um, we have got a minute or so left. Um, I'm wondering, are there any questions for the, uh, for the panel in the room? Maybe not. I know we're approaching lunch very fast. Well, listen, thank you for your attention. Very briefly, to recap, um, the data shows that fundamental interest in sport among young audiences remains strong. Uh, I think it's clear that we have to adapt and evolve our products and marketing to continue engaging young audiences. In doing that, concepts like authenticity, connectedness, community, and inclusiveness will be incredibly important in framing products and marketing. Younger generations are latching on particularly quickly to Web3, and it could be very beneficial to explore that space. And there are powerful opportunities in cultural crossovers with fashion, music, gaming, and so on. But they need to be skillfully integrated, bearing in mind that core idea of authenticity. Um, Acacia, Phoenix, Ravi, thank you so much for your contribution to a fascinating discussion. Uh, that's it from us. Can you please show your appreciation for our panel?